Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode from the RPA Vanguard channel. My name is Andy Menon. In this session, we step into part four of the Automation Summarizer Solution Accelerator series. You might want to stick around for this because in this session, we are going to be running the Automation Summarizer Performer process and discuss a few interesting things that you might want to know. Let's get started. Picking up from where we started, you can see on the screen that the Automation Summarizer has been deployed to a system. And on the left is the target orchestrator instance where uh, I will be pulling the data from. And uh, I just want you to be familiar with the names of the queues uh, that, um, that you see here on the screen. Uh, now that said, usually I do run uh, the, uh, the processes after deploying them to Assistant. But this time I will be running the process from Studio. And the reason for that is I ran into some more issues uh, that might be beyond your control, uh, despite having applied all the fixes uh, to the summarization uh, template, performer template. And uh, you might want to be prepared for uh, those uh, issues, just in case you are faced uh, with the problems that I experienced while running uh, the performer process. So uh, with that, I'm going to switch over to uh, Studio and we'll take it from there. All right, as usual, I have the project open in Studio and we will start off by running uh, this performer process in debug mode. So once I start running this, you will see that I have many number of debug points applied uh, to the, or the debug breakpoints applied uh, to this solution. And uh, as, the, as the process stops at those breakpoints, you will see that they are hitting those uh, places where we applied all those fixes. And along with that, you will also see uh, what the process is doing in the output window on the left, on the bottom left. So here you can see some of the changes that I made for the performer template and I have added those as comments, which would make it easier for me to debug this in the future. And you will see those uh, breakpoints being hit. So this gives me an opportunity to actually stop execution at that point and then kind of uh, debug and observe the, the data items and the variables in their, um, uh, in their runtime state. Right, so this is going to be re repeated because on the left, you will see that the performer template is actually trying to gather data for each of those queues uh, that, that it is targeting, right? And on the left, you will see that uh, it has retrieved the queue data for the first queue uh, in the orchestrator. And as this process keeps running, you will see that um, that list build up. I have fast forwarded some of the steps and um, and then uh, brought us to this stage here in the process where it has gathered the data for all the queue, uh, all the queues um, in the target orchestrator instance. In the previous session, if you recall, uh, there was an issue when we started adding data to their respective data tables because there was a constraint imposed on the uh, on the data table. And here you can see that. Uh, the warnings are being posted to the output, but it is not causing a failure of the performer process. That said, again, I reiterate, this is just a quick fix, but when you are debugging your performer process, you must try to understand why this kind of an error is happening and then try to uh, you know, get solutions so that you do not have this problem. And so we have arrived at the core of the uh, core of the performer process. This is most likely the most interesting part of the entire performer process, right? Uh, we are in the retrieve LLM data flow, and you can see that um, it has paused at the at the spot just before the spot in the process where it is going to uh, choose the currently configured active persona choice. 
so we'll allow this to run uh, a couple of steps and arrive at the prompt. And so we stop here and try to look at the prompt. And this is how an executive prompt is going to look like at runtime. And your prompt may look different depending on the persona you're selecting. So it's a, it's probably a good exercise to repeat this uh, debugging for the other two prompts and compare uh, the differences between each of them. So here is a guided prompt where we are giving, uh, you know, uh, Anthropic Claude the example. Uh, right, and then um, here, uh, where it says the values, you have your actual values that have been retrieved uh, from uh, the orchestrator. So if you look at uh, some of the queue names, you see that it is actually targeting the remote orchestrator that we intended to target. One thing to note, all of my data points are going to say zero, right? That's because I do not have data there and I'm not consistently generating data but you must keep this in mind. This is an exercise for getting your performer to run end to end without any issues, right? Believe me, at the end of this video, I'm going to talk about some of the issues you will, you will face um, despite having applied the fixes and having this performer run end to end, right? So in your case, this data, these data points and the cues uh, that you're targeting might be different and this entire section of text will actually be sent to Anthropic Cloud in AWS Bedrock. And here is the step where that actual interaction between this performer process and AWS Bedrock will take place. And there it is, we have received a response back. Uh, we will allow the step to continue uh, to extract the information from the response. And this is where we have the core of the uh, core of the response from received from the LLM. And we're going to quickly take a look at it. So if you compare the prompt where your data is composed and the response from the LLM, you will see that the LLM has actually used uh, the data points that you sent it and summarized it, right? And then at the bottom, it has its inference, right? It has kind of added an inference in the form of overall summary because that's what you requested. Now, in my case, this output really does not make any sense because all my data points are zero, right? But in your case, you must see much more, um, uh, you know, sen sensible and uh, much more uh, coherent response from your LLM. But at this point, we have proven that our performer process is able to communicate to the LLM and get back the response in a way that you want it. You might not have the data points, but you have the pattern and the structure of the data that you are expecting the LLM to send back to you, right? So if you keep going forward, you will see this um, HTML template pop up. Remember, this is part of your performer template. And there isn't anything here right now. This is the blank template. And there's also a security uh, warning that you have to dismiss. You will not see anything here. And therefore, uh, the best thing for you to do is simply uh, close this out and allow the performer process to continue. So we close that out. And this is something that shows up while you're debugging. It's most likely because I, I dismissed the warning uh, in, that, uh, in that template and caused a change in the state of that HTML uh, template that popped up in Edge. So uh, at this point, uh, you know, you simply accept the changes and move forward and you will see that the performer process has run to completion. So obviously the, uh, you know, the output report will be 
in the data folder of the uh, of the summarizer. Uh, my recommendation to uh, to you is that when you are actually implementing this, uh, you externalize the uh, data folder, meaning have the summarizer um, you know performer publish reports to a folder that can be easily accessible. Otherwise, that data folder is going to be part of the deployed package, the deployed summarizer package, and it's going to be hard to find. Uh, the other thing is uh, you might want to do is you might want to send this report out as um, in the form of email. And the third uh, item is that uh, you might want to kind of clean up your older reports, either archive them or clean up. So here you can see the actual report output. And it is very clear that the, uh, that the uh, summarizer has taken the data returned from the LLM and actually um, put that in an elegant report. So here is uh, an example of some of the earlier runs that I did, um, because uh, when I come to the next section, I'll discuss in detail uh, why uh, you know I had to run this uh, intermittently um, now and then. Uh, but um, on the screen, you will see some of those uh, report examples that I generated. And I'm going to open one at the time where I had data in it. So uh, here you can see that the uh, this is a report that I ran uh, several weeks ago. In fact, a couple of months ago, maybe. And here you can see some tangible data, right? One of the things that I observed is that on the top left, it says total successful transactions is 182. But at the same time, it marks those successful transactions as exceptions uh, in the first first line, right? So there's the Q name, T-Watcher 2022, and there are 182 exceptions. Now, right below that, um, there is the um, Q name again, and then there are 182 exceptions with the exception message itself making no sense. Um, it is advisable that you take a look at the report and and try to understand if this report really makes sense and can go to um, you know the executive level, for example, right? This particular template um, and the prompt that was applied was for the executive persona. But if you look at a report like this, it makes absolutely no sense because even the exceptions don't make any sense. So this is a classic case of uh, uh, you know the effectiveness of LLMs, right? LLMs are pretty capable, but they still don't know what they don't know, right? So if you do not give them proper data, then what comes back will also not make sense, right? So I definitely appreciate the, the format of the data that's come back, but I really do not appreciate uh, the, the report because if I was an executive, this would make no sense to me. And therefore, uh, one of the things that you might want to do um, at a much deeper level is to go back to your performer process and as and when you are troubleshooting the API calls, right? Debugging the API calls and getting the data, just see if the uh, 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 the stages or the steps where you are actually prepping the data to be given to the LLM, right? Uh, whether that uh, needs some more uh, fine tuning, right? That needs some more polishing. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a report like this, right? But again, this proves that the performer process is working. And uh, this is where we will stop our debugging and switch over to some of the problems you will face after the fact, uh, which may or may not be in your control, right? We'll take a look at that next. Uh, honestly speaking, this has been my second recording of part four. I'm glad that I did not release the previous recording because that would have potentially misled me and I would have potentially given you wrong or incorrect information, right? So in this section of the video, I'm going to talk about some of the things that you might face once you operationalize uh, this particular summarizer, right? Um, you might hit uh, this um, this roadblock, and I'm glad I went through that experience so that I can share it with you folks, and then 
um, if you run into this, at least you will know what to do, right? So um, what happened is that I ran this process from the UiPath assistant, like I always do, right? I very rarely run projects from studio. But what happened is unexpectedly it failed on me, right? And I went into the logs and I looked at uh, an error, right? And when I looked at that error, um, it showed that I had placed one too many requests to AWS Bedrock, meaning if I placed a certain number of rapid requests in succession uh, within a certain period of time, uh, AWS Bedrock is going to kick you out, right? There is a retry counter, right? If you look at the screen here where that LLM request is actually happening, it is within the retry scope and there is a retry count. So I did have this error saying one too many requests, but at the same time, the retry count was zero, which made me think, initially I thought that I was I was placing one too many requests because the JSON that we had composed in the process somehow was wrong or the response that was received from the LLM somehow was incorrect and there, or there was a general failure and this retry scope tried to request uh, or talk to the LLM again and it failed several times and because of that I was being kicked out. So basically I could not understand why I was having that error while running from assistant. Uh, so what I did was I had to debug the project again in, uh, in studio. And at this spot, right, it is um, surprisingly at this spot, when I hit the LLM and did the uh, request, right? Because nothing seemed to be out of place. I was able to look at all the models. I had access to all my models, everything was okay. And when, the performer process made the first request to the LLM, it failed instantly, instantly. And it came back saying, you have placed one too many requests. I mean, basically, how can there be one too many requests when you have placed the first request, right? So that made me think that there is something wrong with AWS Bedrock, right? Uh, so I went into the, um, um, I logged into my instance of AWS Bedrock and just for, uh, given the sensitive nature of uh, the information in AWS Bedrock, I have captured some static screenshots, uh, but they should really help you. Um, so uh, what I did was as soon as I logged in, I ran into this problem, right? You can see that as soon as I hit AWS Bedrock uh, landing page, I had this big warning on the top, the provided model identifier is invalid. So I proceeded to the next step and um, and tried to select, uh, you know, Anthropic Cloud and, um, you know, set that model and started a basic conversation, right? And you can see that there was an instant failure and you had that same message, too many requests, please wait before trying, right? This is my first conversation. It's absolutely you know, crazy, right? And if you look on the top right, you will see three counters, right? It says input, output, and latency. Um, they were clocking continuously, right? They would not come back with a response. So I did some research, I looked it up. I thought that something was wrong with my account. So I went and checked whether my keys have expired or whether there is something, something wrong with billing. I checked everything and after all those uh, options were exhausted, I started researching online and it subsequently led me to this repost article, right? And uh, sure enough, a lot of people had this problem, right? Many people had this problem. They didn't know what was happening because they had not, uh, you know, posted one too many requests. They were within the limits. And most importantly, they were pay as you go model, right? In pay as you go, you really pay for what you use. Uh, so people did have this issue. And um, after looking through this page, there is uh, one response uh, that was uh, highly upvoted, right? And that seemed to have been uh, the problem, right? And what it confirmed was that for some reason, right? Amazon had zeroed out the quotas for all their users. 
Um, the uh, forum users also tried several other models uh, in AWS Marketplace. They still had the same problem, right? So this was a general issue. So what I did was I went into my own, uh, uh, you know, uh, service quotas and I looked them up. And sure enough, uh, you can see that all of the service quotas uh, in the first uh, first column on the left, uh, on the right of this page, always zeroed out, right? And I filtered on Cloud Instant and looked at uh, the quotas for the invoke model uh, requests and anything that was related to Anthropic Cloud models, uh, they were all zeroed out. And so what was actually happening was AWS Bedrock service was down. Uh, there was some issue. The quotas were all zeroed out, and there was no way this performer process would work. And this caused tremendous amount of delays for me to uh, to create the recording for this uh, uh, for this part, the part four. And I had to actually redo the recording twice. I'm glad that I went through that process because it begs the question whether we should be creating performer processes that will depend on just one service provider, right? What happens if something like this happens in an active production system, right? And from what I understand is I went through this process over a period of two weeks, right? So that means the LLMs were not available for two weeks for pay-as-you-go customers. In the next section, um, I'll be touching upon what I have been working on and how we might be able to use that to customize the uh, performer process. So we'll take a look at that next. All right, so we are back to our studio project and we are looking at this, um, this particular step in our process where uh, we are establishing our communication and interacting with uh, you know, Anthropic Cloud or any other model in AWS uh, Bedrock. Uh, so what do we do if we want to customize this process, right? Um, if we want to build an alternative standby process uh, that will run if something did happen to you know, Amazon Bedrock and the service is down. If you want to go by, uh, you know, the same pattern, the same design pattern that this uh, performer template is recommending, and that is to, um, uh, you know, use integration service to create a connector to um, um, to a to a service provider like like AWS Bedrock, uh, then, uh, you know, that is also possible, right? That is one option. The other option is to remove this particular step where you are using an integration service connector and then putting in your own HTTP API calls to connect to, let's say, OpenAI or, uh, you know, Cohere or Hugging Face, right? Any of the models publicly available in Hugging Face. Uh, but that also comes at a considerable amount of uh, rework and, um, you know, retests that you have to perform, right? No matter what approach you take, whether you are going to be doing the integration service approach or whether you are going to be doing the HTTP API approach, right? You might have to, you know, modify the prompt extensively, test it, and make sure that the results that you're getting uh, from uh, both versions of these processes are near identical, right? Uh, with that in mind, right, I have been working on a uh, connector for Hugging Face, right? I have been playing around with custom connectors for some time. And I was able to get a connector, uh, you know, up and working. And I just want to walk you through what work has been done, just a quick preview of what has been done. Uh, and then, um, you know, maybe if there is enough interest, uh, create a set of, uh, uh, you know, videos uh, to see how, uh, you know, a custom connector for uh, a model in Hugging Face, right? Uh, can be uh, can be created and used uh, in this performer process. So basically, I have a couple of uh, connectors uh, that uh, that I've published here. One of them has been published, uh, but the other um, is still work in progress. The text to image, I have not worked on it for some time, but uh, what's actively being used is the RVG hugging face. Uh, 
custom connector on the left, right? Uh, so this is a working connector and I have tested it um, both in Studio and uh, Studio Web and um, it is working the way I want it. So we'll go over to Studio Web and quickly look at uh, a couple of projects, just go through, breeze through a couple of projects uh, that I created uh, using uh, this uh, connector. And then I will also show you the different modes in which I have used this connector. One of the things to remember is that creating a custom connector comes with its own challenges, but uh, it was it was a, a learning experience and I thoroughly enjoyed doing that. And maybe if you guys are interested, then I can I can uh, make a make a couple of videos on that subject. So uh, here you can see that this is a very simple flow in Studio Web, and um, I am actually using the Hugging Face uh, connector and communicating to the uh, to the Meta Llama uh, model in Hugging Face. Um, and this model uh, is available in my instance of the Hugging Face Cloud. And uh, here you can see that uh, this method says insert record. That's because if you want to make a post request to uh, to uh, Hugging Face, it is known as an insert record, uh, uh, you know, action call in uh, your in uh, your custom connector. And um, everything else is. Uh, straightforward, you can see that I have selected the action, I've selected the object, and then passed in all the uh, other parameters to make that call. Uh, but if we look beyond this simple step, getting the response back and then uh, parsing them out uh, is challenging. Uh, that's what uh, you know. I uh, understood uh, from this whole experience. Uh, so uh, this is the this is one version of uh, of the project, right? Opening up the HTTP version, um, uh, you will see that this particular action where I'm calling uh, the uh, the model, this action step is different, right? Um, and I'm calling this over a more basic HTTP API call, right? That is also possible for you to configure in your custom connector. And this works exactly the same as, way as the previous version, but uh, this method, in my opinion, is a lot easier. And it also helps you deal with, uh, with some of the complexities of the request that you're placing to, uh, to your uh, LLM. Uh, but uh, you must understand that you should compose or create the custom connector correctly uh, for this to become easier. So what I'm trying to drive towards is that you already have seen in this uh, automation summarizer solution accelerator series uh, how to how to set up and run uh, the performer process right you already know that and you've also seen where you want to make that change right on the other hand i've also shown you one of the options uh, that you can take in order to uh, you know swap out uh, your llm functionality of your performer process right and that is to create your own custom connector and then use that in place of uh, the AWS Bedrock connector that's provided by UiPath, right? So in the end, uh, you can put both of these concepts together and, uh, you know, customize your performer template to work with any model, uh, uh, you know, that is hosted on any provider, including the if there is a hosting facility inside your enterprise and, and have the performer generate uh, the reports uh, that you need uh, based on um, your business requirements. So that is all for today. And uh, this brings the Automation Summarizer uh, Solution Accelerator series to an end. I hope that uh, through this series, uh, you have learned something new. Please do like and subscribe to my channel. I'll truly appreciate it. I will talk to you soon. Thank you and bye.